after coming from our very difficult weeks, most of us, being able to assemble here together to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, <clears throat> what a blessing. What a blessing it is. And we strengthen each other just by our presence here. And there are some of our number who really want to be here and can't be. So we want to make, make sure we keep remembering that in our prayers. Well, we're continuing in the book of Mark. And the last time we were in the Gospel of Mark, we read verses 1 through 15. And we broke it down into three sections. The Gospel was prophesied, verses 1 through 3. The Gospel was prepared, verses 4 through 13. And this is what we looked at last time. And finally, the gospel was preached, and that's verses 14 and 15, and that's what we'll be looking at specifically today. The gospel was preached. So down to verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So, verse 14 tells us about John the Baptist being in prison. And Mark tells us later in chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. He gives us the reason for this. Herod had laid hold of John the Baptist and he bound him in prison because of Herodias his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And John had told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So we'll examine this in more detail in another sermon later on. But now, back to Jesus. What was he doing? He is preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And what was his message? Well, look at verse 15. The time is fulfilled... The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was his message. So Jesus, Son of God, our Lord and Savior, was a preacher. Now, sadly, preaching has gotten quite a bad reputation in our modern day. One reason for this is because of the many scandals brought about by the televangelists over the years. And other things. I mean, when Betty and I were down in Alabama, the church, the Lord's church had scandals of its own, I'm sorry to say. But also the very nature of preaching tends to bring with it some negative connotations. Have you ever had someone say to you, don't preach to me? Don't preach to me? Well, that's, that's very negative. And because of this, some denominations, and I mentioned this in Bible class this morning, some of the denominations have de-emphasized preaching, and they've gone to having um, role-playing or dramas in, in its place. But preaching, preaching is ordained by God as the approved method of communicating His Word. As the inspired Apostle Paul declares in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, God has in due time that is, the right time of his own choosing, manifested or revealed or made known his word. How? How has God manifested, revealed, or made known his word? Paul says, through preaching, which was committed to me according to the command of God our Savior. There are two Greek words translated preach and preaching in the New Testament. The first is used here in our text, that is caruso, which means to herald divine truth as a public crier. You know, in colonial times, they had the public crier come out ringing a bell and, and shouting messages uh, that were needful for the populace to hear. That's the idea, to herald divine truth as a public crier, to openly proclaim or formally publish with authority, parenthetically. <clears throat> the second word is euangelizo, and that means to bring glad 
for good tidings concerning salvation that is found in Christ. We might say today that the evangelist is a good newser. He brings good news. And the word is very close to the word gospel, euangelion, which is defined as good tidings or glad tidings of the salvation found in and through Jesus Christ. So this is the gospel message. And notice there are no negative connotations here, are there? This is good news. This is God's plan for redeeming man. So we find the practice of preaching going all the way back to Noah and the antediluvians. Isn't that a great word? <coughs> antediluvians. It, it simply means the people who lived before the flood. If you impress somebody, just bring that into a conversation. Antediluvians. Great word. But it was those who lived before the flood. If you would turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll go down to verse, well, I'll start at verse 4 of 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh. For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So we, uh, and this word, uh, preacher, is the Greek word kerux. Uh, it's K-E-R-Y-X. And it means a herald of divine truth. That's what Noah was. Uh, he was a proclaimer of God's word. That's the meaning also. So we surmise that for 120 years before the flood, while the ark was being prepared, while Noah was building the ark, he faithfully preached to the people of his day, to the antediluvians, and he preached the message of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. But none of these wicked people to whom Noah faithfully preached repented. Not one of them. However, the wicked people of Nineveh did repent. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. And we read in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God through the preaching of Jonah. They proclaimed a fast. And they put on sackcloth. Now, this putting on of sackcloth was, was an outward sign of showing inward penitence and sorrow for their sin. And they did this from the greatest to the least of them. This is their response at the preaching of Jonah, who proclaimed to them the word of God. And Jesus used these penitent souls, those penitent souls of Nineveh, as an example to the impenitent scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus said, The men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Of course, he's speaking of himself. So what a preacher does is exemplified in another Old Testament passage. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, we read, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Now ask yourself, how do you prepare your heart to seek the law of the Lord? Read through the Bible. Through study. That's how you do it. So Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. He studied the law of the Lord. And then to do it. What does that mean? He's taking what he learns and he's applying it to his own life. And then to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. 
That's what a preacher does. He studies the Word of God, he applies it to his own life, and then he teaches it to God's people. That's what he does. Now turn, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah. Sometimes hard to find us before the Psalms. So Nehemiah, let's go to chapter 8. This is a marvelous account, which really elevates the Word of God. So I'm going to be starting at verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And this is a, this is like a gospel meeting. This is a revival. People are coming back to, to the Lord. And now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear and understand on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 4. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood. This will put him up above so the people can see him. King James says a pulpit of wood. I love that. So he was on this platform of wood which they made for the purpose. And beside him at his right hand stood, and he had uh, all these men who I'm not going to try to pronounce. Yeah. And verse 5, Ezra opened the book in sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people on this platform of wood. And when he opened the word of God, he opened it, all the people stood up. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to listen. Reverence, respect for the word of God. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, then all the people answered, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> While lifting up their hands. So, this word, Amen, what's that word mean? Let it be so, or may it be so. Exactly. And I, I hardly concur or agree with what has been, what has been spoken. So, yeah, they're, Amen, Amen. While well, they lifted up their hands, and they bowed their heads, again, reverence, and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Humility. And also, and then it names these men, and also the Levites. Verse 7, help the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. Verse 8, so they read, and this is where we really want to pay attention. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God. They, and they gave the sense... <clears throat> And, and help them to understand the reading. Well, that's what a preacher does. That's what verse 8 says. Reads from the book, the law of God, the word of God, gives the sense and helps them to understand the reading. So part of the preacher's job is to help the people of God understand the word of God. That's what he does. The preacher is to faithfully preach that is Caruso, the word. He is to be ready in season and out of season. He is to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. Now he's to be ready in season and out of season. I don't have my water. He's to be ready in season and out of season. What's that mean? At all times. He's to be ready at all times to preach the word. One version says he's to be ready when it's convenient to do so and when it's not convenient to do so. And he is to convince, that is to admonish or reprove. He is to rebuke, and that means to censure or to identify a fault. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> My thorn in the flesh is... <laughs> One of my thorns. I got many thorns. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that hits. <clears throat> okay, so to convince is to admonish, reprove, to rebuke is to censure, identify a fault. We need that, don't we? We have faults. Sometimes we don't see them. <coughs> Someone else has to come up and and, uh, and talk to us about it. To exhort. That word means to encourage. 
to strengthen, to build up. Wonderful word. With all long suffering, with all patience and doctrine. That is, that is teaching. Teaching from God's word. So I mentioned before that preaching is ordained by God as the approved method of communicating his holy word. And Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was appointed, was commissioned a preacher. In Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, Jesus cites a prophecy that's found in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and he applies it to himself. So let's turn to Luke chapter 4. Let's go down to verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So Luke chapter 4, verse 16 says, So he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he, had, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel. To the poor. And he cites this Isaiah prophecy and applies it to himself. The gospel was preached. Preaching and teaching was the method used for spreading and furthering the gospel message. Jesus had commanded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, what has come to be known as the Great Commission. Jesus commanded, Go ye therefore. And do what? Teach all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. How many things? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. So these were and are to this day the marching orders for the army of God, the Lord's church the Church of Christ. Now in the book of Acts, we find out how the early Christians obeyed the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, this great commission. So let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to chapter 5 in the book of Acts. A lot of times the question is asked, how in the world did the early church grow so much, so fast? <clears throat> So incredibly, well, it was the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. So let's go down to Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily, every day, day in and day out, in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Daily, preaching and teaching that's how it was done. Go to chapter 6, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Why? As a result of the preaching and the teaching, day in and day out. Go now to Acts chapter 8. chapter 8. Look at uh, down to verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. This is the dispersion, the persecution. Those who were scattered went everywhere and hid. 
No, it doesn't say that. What did they do? They went everywhere preaching the word, preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. What did he do there? Preached Christ to them. That's how the early church grew by leaps and bounds. Look down to verse 35. Then this is the account of Philip the evangelist and, and the eunuch. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture where the eunuch was reading, preached Jesus to him. There's the preaching. Now go to chapter 11, look at verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received what? The word of God. How was that done? As a result of the preaching and teaching that was done day in and day out. Now down to verse 20 in chapter 11. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now I'll get down to chapter, oh, excuse me, verse 25. Uh, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. Constant teaching. That's what we talked about in Bible class. The elevation and emphasis on the Word of God and the teaching, teaching, teaching. Fundamentals of the faith and not only the milk of the Word, but the, the meat of the Word. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. One of the beautiful texts. Um, okay, let's go to chapter 12. Now, let's go down to verse 24. One verse, but the word of God grew and multiplied. How? Preaching and teaching. Day in and day out by the members of the Lord's church. Okay. Um, so that was 1224. Let's go to 13.5. And when they arrived in Salamis, what did they do? They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. And then down to verse 44 in chapter 13. On the next Sabbath almost the whole city came together. Why? To hear the word of God. That's, that's powerful. And then down to verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. The work is being done, isn't it? The work is being done. The gospel is being preached. The gospel is being spread. Okay, let's go to 14 verse 7. And they were preaching the gospel there. Well, they preached the gospel wherever they went. Down to verse 21. When they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Um, great preaching, great teaching. And then, um, verse 25, Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Now to 15, verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch. What were they doing? Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. The gospel is being preached. Uh, chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep which were determined by the apostles and elders of Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Churches growing through the teaching and preaching 
of God's Word to chapter 17 down to verse 2. Then Paul's as custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. This is not opinion sharing. He's reasoning with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And then down to verse 11. I love this. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. So there was opposition uh, to the preaching of the word of God. Now to chapter 18, down to verse 4. Then he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Then down to verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Uh, verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months doing what? Teaching the word of God among them. Wow. And um, 24, down to verse 24. Oh, this is uh, the account of Apollos. We love Apollos. A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Isn't that a great way to be remembered or to be identified? <laughs> you know, mighty in the scriptures. Uh, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he uh, desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Verse 28, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing again from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, what a great account. Um, to verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 19, verse 8. Then he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Down to verse 20. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. That's what happens when the word is preached and when the word is taught uh, faithfully. Then um, down to, down to uh, let's see, 19, verse 20. Now 26, all the way back to uh, chapter 26. Chapter 26 down to verse, well, I think I'll start at verse 14. So this is Paul's recounting of, of his conversion. We had all fallen to the ground, and I heard a voice speak to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And so I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand, and the reason I wanted to read this is because this is what the, the Lord is saying, the preaching does. Rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which, will yet, which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles whom I now send you. To open their eyes, and this is where we really want to pay attention. This is what the preaching will do. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Isn't that powerful? That's what the faithful preaching and teaching of the word will do. Uh, therefore, King Agrippa, 
I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. And that's the same thing Jesus was preaching in Mark chapter 1, isn't it? Verse 15. That they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. So, there it is. That's a great text. And now, all the way to the end of the book, this is how Paul finished out his life in uh, Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. This is how the great apostle Paul finished out his life. Verse 30 of chapter 28, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Preacher to the end. So, <clears throat> the gospel was preached. The New Testament church took the Great Commission to heart, didn't they? And he took it into all the world. They took the marching orders of the Lord Jesus Christ very seriously, and they went everywhere preaching the Word, Acts chapter 8, verse 4. And the Word of God spread, and the Word of the Lord grew and multiplied, and the, the number of disciples multiplied greatly, and because of their faithful teaching and preaching, a great many were obedient to the faith. And as a result, the churches were strengthened in the faith, we read, and increased in number daily, Acts chapter 16, verse 5. So because of the faithful preaching and teaching by our first century brethren, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Acts chapter 19, verse 20. So much so that it could be said by Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, that the gospel which you heard was preached to every creature under heaven. Wow. In other words, the gospel had been preached by the Lord's church throughout the known world of their day. They took the Great Commission very seriously, didn't they? The Lord's uh, marching orders, if you will. And it started with the message preached by the greatest preacher of all time, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what was his message? Going back to Mark. Chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was his message. The kingdom of God, the Lord's church, was established in A.D. 33 on the day of Pentecost, shortly after the Lord had ascended to heaven. Now the best thing 21st century men and women can do for themselves is to obey the first century preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. If this is your desire this morning, please come and make your request known as we stand and sing.